Information, please. Wake up, Mr. and Mrs. America. Time to stump the experts. The catch-is-catch-can battle of the great American public versus our quartet of mental giants continues. Do you want to get into this question and answer game that has the whole country by the mental ears? Well, here's how. Send us questions and the correct answers. If acceptable to our editors, they will be presented to a board of experts for the first time during each broadcast. Any question accepted will win $2 for the person who submits it. Any question the experts cannot answer will win an extra $5. The contest will be refereed by our Master of Ceremonies, Mr. Clifton Fadiman, literary critic of the New Yorker magazine. Clifton Fadiman. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I want to begin this evening by reminding our audience that our experts are real experts and no fooling. Last week, for instance, John Kieran, sports columnist of the New York Times, gave you fair warning that Joe Lewis would win his fight with Smiley. And he did. Information, please, never fails. Take a bow, Miss Kieran. <laughs> now, serving along with Mr. Kieran on the jury tonight are Franklin C. Adams, director of the famous Conning Tower column in the New York Post, a self-confessed humorist. Uh, Mark Duffield, day news editor of the New York Herald Tribune, a self-confessed journalist. And as our guest of honor, we are happy to welcome the first woman to sit in on Information Please board, Carmel Snow, editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar and a self-confessed feminist. And now, folks, remember, this quartet hasn't seen these questions in advance. This is an informal, spontaneous, unrehearsed, uninhibited, unrestrained program. Questions are addressed to the entire board. Any member who wishes to may raise his or her hand and try to answer the question I will read. The question must be answered by one member, except where it's composed of more than two parts. In that case, the board may cooperate. But if any part is answered incorrectly, $5 is forfeited. When you hear that cash register sound, that means $5 is actually being paid out to the lucky questioner. And now, oh, that sound, that's just Mr. Adams coining an epigram. <laughs> Enough of this frivolity. Now, my fine feathered experts, I want you and your imagination to travel back. Far back to your childhood. Okay, start traveling. Uh, Mr. Kieran, you reached your childhood yet? Yes, sir. Stop. <laughs> First question. From Miss Rose Hilton, 246 West End Avenue, New York City. Recite or sing. If you answer this, Mr. Adams, just figure on reciting it, will you please? <laughs> uh, recite or sing well-known nursery rhymes which employ for their theme accident, fright, starvation, and thievery. Dreadful question. Fright, starvation, thievery, accident. You can begin with thievery, fright, starvation, accident, whatever you please. What's that last one? Thievery? Thievery, yes. You ever hear of it, Miss Kieran? Thievery. Well, thievery. Yes, yeah. thievery, that's right. <laughs> All right. All right, Miss Kieran. What's that first one now? First one is accident. You needn't start with Jack accident. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pair of That's water. correct. That's enough. He knows it. That's correct. <laughs> Uh, the next, uh, Fright. Uh, well, skip that for a minute and give me the next All one. right. Starvation. Uh, old Mother Hubbard lived in the cupboard. That's right, that's Went right. Went to a cupboard and so right. forth. He knows starvation. A thievery. Taffy was a Welshman. Taffy was a thief. That's correct. <laughs> If there are any Welsh listening in, I want to remind them that is an eternal libel on the Welsh race. I don't think how that ever happened. And fright, finally. I think I scared Mr. Kieran on this fright. Does this cost me five dollars to sit here and think? <laughs> it may. While Mr. Kieran is sitting and thinking, how about volunteers from some of the others? Fright. Any nursery rhyme involving somebody uh, being scared? Well, there's, there's one that ends up, uh, poor cat fright. Poor oh, cat fright. Yes, sir. Do you think that has anything to do with real fright or terror, or is it just a name? No, I think that's just a nickname. Just a nickname. I'm afraid we can't let it come in. Then how about it, Mr. Kieran? How about the goblins will get you if you don't flash out? It's a very nice poem, but it's not a nursery rhyme. James Whitcomb Riley, I think. 
Give another five or six seconds on it. Too bad. Three out of four. Can't get it, Miss Kieran. Mrs. Oh, Delfield. Mrs. Snow. Count Snow. Count. Trying to think. Miss Adams. They're really doing their best, folks. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry that's going to cost us five dollars. Now, the one dealing with fright, of course, is little Miss Muffet. That's on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. <laughs> Three out of four. All right. <clears throat> Next one is for Mr. William Sheehan, 461 West 163 Street, New York City. And this is a triple threat fourth question, composed of three parts. One, what ball player was recently fined $250 for refusing to change his shirt? That's what it says. You'd rather lose $250 than lose a shirt, apparently. Mr. Kieran, I think we ought to start you on that. Yes, uh, that's a pitcher by the name of Johnny Allen of the Cleveland Indians, who has won nine games and lost one game this season. And he was ordered to take off a shirt at the Yankee Stadium recently because it had holes in it, like a ventilated spinnaker. <laughs> and uh, he refused to take off the shirt and... Uh, was fined two hundred and fifty dollars uh, by his club. Thank you very much. How do you know all these things? <laughs> what a lot of useless information you carry around your head. <laughs> uh, try this one. What ball player was dropped from a pennant-winning club because he jumped into a lake? That's what it says. Because uh, he jumped into a lake. Yes, that's right. There was a ball player by the name of Al Devorma was with the pennant-winning Yankees of nineteen twenty-two. Hey, uh, the bags were packed up in Chicago one time, and he was sitting on a lake front, and another player dared him to jump in with his store clothes on, and he did. And Miller Huggins was a conservative uh, uh, man, and he thought that that was a little bit uh, too much mm -hmm. to have on a championship ball club, and he sold him to Boston. Pretty good. You want to continue that in our next uh, issue? <laughs> You know, folks, uh, I, I hardly believe myself that these are unrehearsed programs when I listen to Mr. Karen, but they really are. Uh, third, did any runner ever win an Olympic race after breaking his leg? Just let's have a short, snappy, correct answer. <laughs> uh, I know two runners who uh, won. <laughs> he knows two. No biographies, just All right. names. All right, a sewing machine salesman, 40 years old, from Finland, named Albin Stenroos, won the uh, marathon in 1924 at Paris. And John Edward Lovelock, a medical man in a hurry, uh, won the 1,500-meter Olympic championship in world's record time at Berlin in 1936. That's absolutely correct. Right. Now, Mr. Karen, you just rest on your laurels for a moment, <laughs> and uh, we'll let someone else have a chance. This comes from Mr. William Barish, 5913 Alma Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. What three public offices did Franklin D. Roosevelt hold before becoming the President of the United States? Three public offices. Don't whisper the answers. I know the audience is brighter than the experts. <laughs> uh, Mr. Adams. Uh, Vice President of the United States. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Franklin D. Roosevelt. Governor of New York. Governor of New York is correct, yes. Assistant Secretary of the Navy. That's correct. And the third? Mr. Duffield, <laughs> talk about on that. What public, what third public office? How about it, boys? How about it? Mr. Keir? Help, help. Duffield are looking at each other. <laughs> Getting no response. Might have been sheriff of Dutchess County. No, it was, <laughs> was not. It's going to cost us $5, I'm afraid. Well, the third was, of course, his first public office in 1909. He was a member of the New York State Legislature, a uh, state senator, I believe. I think we should have known that, boys. I think we should have known that. Next question. From Mrs. R.F. Helen Bosworth, 283 St. Paul Street, Brookline, Massachusetts. Now attend carefully. What office created these famous detectives? I'm going to read eight detectives, and you'll have to name six out of the eight. First, Sherlock Holmes, volunteer. Sherlock Holmes, Mr. Duffield. Conan Doyle. Correct. Uh, the second, Philo Van. Mr. Adams. S.S. S. Van Dyne. Mr. Adams, do you remember Ogden Nash's very bitter couplet about Philo Van? I might, but that isn't in the question. It isn't in the question. <laughs> Well, 
Well, I'm not paid for this, so I'll uh, yes, tell you what the couplet is. Philo Vance needs a kick in the pants. Don't you remember? <laughs> Reggie Fortune is next. Reggie Fortune? Don't know their detective story. Reggie Fortune. Well, that's one out. H.M. Bailey is the author of the creator of the famous detective Reggie Fortune, the Reggie Fortune Mysteries. Uh, Lord Peter Whimsy. Lord Peter Whimsy. That English woman, you know. Lord Peter Whimsy. Not Whimsy, Whimsy. W I M S E Y. I'm afraid I'll have to count that. Dorothy two. Sayers. Dorothy Sayers is correct. Just came in by the skin of your teeth, Mr. Adams. Very good. Uh, Perry Mason. Perry Mason. They read a lot, folks, but they don't read detective stories. Perry Mason. They used to publish the Youth's Companion. That's irrelevant. Uh, Perry Mason. It's an American, very famous American detective story writer named Earl Stanley Gordon. That's two. A.Z. Mayo. A.Z. Mayo. A.S.E.Y. Mayo, M.A.Y.O. I think I've got them on the run now. C.B. Atwood Taylor. Famous Cape Cod mystery stories, I think they are. Ellery Queen. The answer to that's a sticker. Mr. Adams. Ellery Queen. That's correct. <laughs> uh, Arsene Lupin. Arsene Lupin. Or Lupin, if you wish. Very famous, old-time French, as you can very well imagine, detective story writer, named Maurice LeBlanc. They only got four out of eight there. That's going to cost us $5, I'm afraid. Next time you come here, be sure that you've read detective stories. Next one comes from Mr. Bob Weltner, Jr., 21 Bryan Street, Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Name five wildflowers that are named after people. Not people that are named after flowers. That is, rose wouldn't be uh, correct. Five wildflowers that include in their names the names of people. Uh, Latin, uh, or, Latin or English names. How many languages do you know, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I can try some of these flowers. There's the Deutsch here, the uh, Bougainvillea. Uh, that's correct, that's correct. I haven't those down on my card, but that's quite correct. That's two. How about Mr. Adams? Help us Fuchsia. Out. Fuchsia. Is that, a, is that a man? <laughs> Fuchsia? That's named after a man. It is named after a man. I didn't mean exactly that uh, type of uh, name. Uh, Black-Eyed Susan would be an example of what Johnny I Johnny Jump. I beg your pardon? Johnny Jump. That's right. That's four. When you have one more. Bachelor's Button. <laughs> <laughs> Why, Mr. Adams, I think that's a joke. Uh, no. Well, that's not named after a woman. No, that's right. <laughs> Well, would you, would you count a violet? Would you call that? Uh, I might let it in. I'd rather have something better than that. One more. Flowers that include first names in them. Daisy. No. Nope. Seems to me that the uh, person is named after the flower. Four. Four. I think I ought to give them a Solomon name. Seal. Solomon Seal is correct. Right? That's five. Uh, can you think of one with Jerry in it? Just occurred to me. Jerry, Jerry. How about Mr. Jerry? Very easy. Jerry Anium. Jerry Anium. <laughs> okay. Let's go on. Uh, this comes from Miss Ella Hole, 449 West Bringer Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. What do the following numbers suggest? Name five out of six. 7-Eleven. Guys. Dice for Mr. Kieran. He knows that one, too. Uh, 212. 212. Is this a game? No. <laughs> Boiling point of water. That's correct, Mr. Kieran. Fahrenheit. Yes. 40 and 8. Don't tell us the history of Mr. Fahrenheit. <laughs> uh, 40 and 8, Mr. Adams. Sign on a French uh, car. Yes, meaning what? 40 men and 8 horses. That's correct. Horses lengthwise. Uh, 186,000. 186,000. Mr. Duffield. Speed of light. That's correct. 400. Mr. Snow, perhaps. Society. Society, Society. yes, quite correct. Uh, 600. Mr. Adams. 
The number of the, at the charge at Balaclava. Very good. Very good. The Light Brigade. Uh, that's correct. That's done out of time. I think I'll put in one more just for fun. How about the number seven? None of you can answer that. This is the seventh broadcast of information, please. Advertisement. <laughs> the uh, next question from Miss Alice Landau, Chicago, Illinois, is this. Can you name an article of women's clothing, currently or recently fashionable, that derives from a native costume of each of the following countries? Now, Mrs. Snow, I, I imagine you want to take this one. And please don't get the idea that I know the answer to it. <laughs> Whatever you say is okay with me. Uh, Spain. Spain. Uh, Espadil. That would be Bolero. correct. Uh, yes. Very good. Austria. Dirndl, of course. Uh, Dirndl, yes. How, how do you spell Dirndl, Mrs. Snow? I couldn't possibly spell it. D-I-R-N-D-L. <laughs> well, I, I, I only I saw it today, and I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> Did you really see it spelled D-I-R-N-D-L? Yes. Mm. Well, I think that's wrong. I think it's D-R-N-D-L. Oh. They say no. <laughs> uh, don't ring up $5 on me. <laughs> uh, Scotland, Mrs. Snow. Scotland. Uh, plan. Yes. Uh, France. Um, uh, Breton sailor. That's quite that correct. Uh, Greece. Greece is a tough Sandals? One. Do you think? Sandals or, well... Tunic. Tunic, no, yes, very good. Yes. I have something down here called... Cosmetic. Chocolate. Cosmetic? Uh, uh, oh, Greece, I see what you mean. Mr. Adams, I see exactly what you mean, but I just don't like what I see, that's all. Uh, uh, Russia. Mrs. Russia. No. Uh, Russian blouse, yes. Cossack. Coast? Yes, quite right. And finally, China. China. Uh, well, the, the coolie coat. Coolie coat would be correct. Hmm? That's quite correct. Uh -huh. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Smith. <laughs> Mr. Frank A. Battle of 288 Park Street, Hackensack, New Jersey, wants to know how many men were on base when Casey struck out. <laughs> how many men were on base when Casey struck out? Why, folks, this is the first time I've seen an expression of amazement or astonishment on Mr. Kieran's face. No. He and I have been working together. Yeah, there were three on base. There were three on base? Yes. Name them, give their weight and height. <laughs> <laughs> now, were there three on base, Mr. Kieran? Well, I believe it's so described in the poem by Mr. Thayer, but I don't remember it all. Well, you got the name of the author right, but otherwise you're wrong. I'm sorry to say that's going to cost us five dollars. How many were on? There were... There were only two on, but Flynn let fly a single to the wonderment of all, and the much despised Blakey tore the cover off the ball, and when the dust had lifted and they saw what had occurred, there was Blakey safe at second and Flynn a hugging third. That makes Blakey and Flynn on base, correct? Yes. Two. We've got him finally, folks. The the up is down the for the count. The got up to go. <laughs> in deep despair, the rest. Uh, now, so far, we have lost $20, doing just middling well. Next question from Mr. Rufus F. Meyer, 233 Wimbledon Road, Rochester, New York. To whom do the following official titles belong? There are four official titles. One, Keeper of the 24 Golden Umbrellas. Keeper of the 24 Golden Umbrellas. They look pretty blank. They look blanker. <laughs> Probably they look blanker. Somebody in uniform downstairs. <laughs> not official, not official. Keep the 24 golden umbrellas. The king of Siam is the answer. The king of Siam. You knew that, Mr. Kieran, didn't you? Uh, now I know it. Yes. <laughs> uh, two, conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. Mr. Duffield. King of Ethiopia. Yes. Late king of Ethiopia. Next king. <laughs> Next king. Former king. Don't, don't quarrel, don't boys X. and girls. Don't quarrel. Don't say X in the time. Uh, three, defender of the faith. Uh... Defender of the faith. Mrs. Mrs. Snow? No. no. Uh, I'm afraid not. Uh, the, uh, the monarch of Portugal. No, I'm afraid not. Uh, Mr. Duffy. I'll try the king of England. Though. King of England is correct, but I'm afraid we've gotten it wrong. Uh, the first two were wrong. And four, the great white father. The great white father. Mr. Adams. 
President of the United States. Yes, whose official title is that? I mean, who gives him that official title? The, the Indians. Indians. The Indians is correct. However, we only got two out of four on that. We must bring up $5 for Mr. Meyer, who brought you to New York. Uh, next, this is for Mrs. H.F. Blanchard, 37 Reed Avenue, Crestwood, New York. Very simple question. Name these gals. Spelled G-A-L-S. Mr. Adams, would you like to take a chance on naming these gals? One, who dwelt among the untrodden ways? Lucy. Lucy, yes. <laughs> uh, uh, who was Lucy, was it? Wordsworth. Wordsworth. <laughs> Little Lucy. That's correct. Two. We've got to get uh, four out of five on this. Two. Who lived many and many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea? Any other volunteers in case Mr. Adams doesn't know Annabelle it? Lee. Annabelle Lee. Mr. Adams knows it. That's correct. Who is Annabelle Lee? Mr. Poe's Annabelle uh, Lee. <laughs> if you think I'm going to say you're Annabelle Lee, you're crazy. <laughs> Three. Who raked the meadows sweet with hay? Mr. Kieran. Maud Muller. Yes, who's Maud Muller? Uh, John uh, Greenleaf Whittier. That's right. I Four. thought you were going to say Wagner. <laughs> and I thought you were going to say Shakespeare. You always do, Mr. Adams. Well, I'm usually right. <laughs> yeah, once out of twice. Four. Whose fair face beams in all my dreams? Whose fair face beams in all my dreams? Mr. Adams. Whose sweet Adeline, I don't know. <laughs> and number five, we've already won the five dollars. Five, who cried for you and you alone? I'd turn a kingdom down. For you and you alone, I'd turn a kingdom down. Mr. Duffield, do you know that? No, you don't. That Mr. Kieran, you don't know that. Uh, she was probably lying anyway. <laughs> yes, but that's not the answer. Mr. Snow, you don't know that? I'm afraid I am. Mr. Adams, you don't know that. No, he doesn't. Folks, do you know who wrote that? I'll tell you. Franklin P. Adams, and he doesn't know it. <laughs> Seems to me, Mr. Adams, you forget your ladies awfully quickly when you write about them. <laughs> Next question. They come easy and go easy. <laughs> nice to know that. Next is from Mr. Alfred Count of San Francisco. What important event and what famous person were largely responsible for introducing the bobbed hair vogue? Um, oh, Mrs. No, let's have that. Irene Castle, I think. Irene Castle. You know the uh, circumstances connected with that? Oh, uh, wasn't it just after the war? I mean, the World War. Was... Uh, just during it, yes. Yes, during yes. it. Well, uh, no, I don't really know why. She cut her hair. Yes. No. Did you know why she did? No. Well, I wouldn't know either if I didn't have it down on this card. <laughs> I think it bothered her why she was dancing. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, it, uh, she uh, set that fashion when the after effects of the fever made it necessary for her to appear on the stage with oh. clipped hair. That's correct. The uh, next question is from John Rogers of Kansas City, Missouri. Identify four out of five of the following. I'll read them all, and then I'll read them one by one. Shrike. Skate, skimmer, skink, spink. The first is Shrike, S-H-R-I-K-E. A uh, Shrike is a, uh, a bird about, uh, well, there are three varieties of Shrike. Never mind. <laughs> One more Shrike like that from you and you're out. <laughs> uh, second, Skate. Skate is a fish. It's All a right, good. Fish. Don't tell us its name, family. Right. Uh, skimmer. A skimmer, uh, S K I M. A skimmer is uh, also a bird, and I can give you a. I'll stop. All right. No. A bird. <laughs> I know you can. I know you can. Uh, skink. A skink is an insect. Uh, uh, well, it's a small animal. It's not an insect. No, not an insect. It's a small animal of the. Uh... No Latin now. Well, no Latin. <laughs> well, a salamander type. Yes, that's the lizard type. And spink, which is not the present sense of spank, by the way, Mr. Kieran. <laughs> spink. What's a spink? Uh, it's the sound that you get when you pluck a banjo. Correct, but that's not the answer to this question, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, a spink is not in my bright lexicon of youth. Don't know it, eh? Well, now I'll, I'll give you a quotation, which I just remembered, which is practically, which practically uses spink. It's what you're in... Did you ever hear of the spink of condition? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's no answer either. 
freedom, Mr. Adams. <laughs> Why, it's the primrose. The primrose. Don't you remember the famous quotation from Wordsworth? A spink by the river's brim, a yellow spink was to him, and it was nothing more. Well, I got four to five on that. That's what they were supposed to get. Uh, the next one comes from uh, Mary R. Vestal, 44 Langdon Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Kipling has said, the female of the species is more deadly than the male. Can you quote two other selections, also uncomplimentary to the lady? I beg your pardon, Mrs. Snow. I had no idea I was going to have to ask this question when you were on the board this evening. <laughs> Seems Kipling. very inhospitable. No, any two other quotations. Any two other. Kipling was just to start you off, which are uncomplimentary to the lady. Sure, a rag and a bone and a hank of hair. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Let's have another one. Come on, Frank. <laughs> I guess you think I'm a cad. <laughs> oh, Frank, come on, be a cad for a minute or two, will you? An uncomplimentary quotation about the... Mrs. Snow, I hate to ask you to do this. Can you remember one? I'm thinking... Well, that's half the battle. And I learned about women from her. That's complimentary. That's complimentary. <laughs> but <laughs> not the way he meant it, it wasn't. Well, if it isn't complimentary, it's supplementary, then. Well, no, I would accept that. Call her a shiny she-devil. Where's that from? That's from uh, the same poem. I suppose that would go. That, that, that was quite all right. I'll let them pass. Uh, some of the others that I think are perhaps more familiar to us are Frailty, Thy Name is Woman. You remember that, don't you, Miss Karen? Yes, sir. That's from uh, Hamlet. Didn't ask you that. And that's, <laughs> that's complimentary. That's t you think that's complimentary? I do. He likes fra Oh, you like frailty. I see. I love it. Uh, another one would be, uh, nor hell a fury like a woman scorned. Well, we'll have a uh, chance for one more question. Let's see if we can get through this one very quickly. From Mr. Harold Saunders, Atlanta, Georgia. Identify the following Chinese whose names have appeared in the news in recent years. One, Sun Yat-sen, Mr. Duffield. Former president of China. Yes, Henry Pu Yi. The uh, boy emperor of Manchu. Correct. Oh. Anna Mae Wong. Don't get this Wong now. Anna Mae Wong. <laughs> <laughs> A very lovely actress. Uh, correct. Chu Te, C-H-U-T-E-H. -E He's the communist general of the 8th Route Army. Correct. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek. President of the dictator of China. Very good. First plate. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's all the questions we'll have time for tonight. Now, the total penalties, why, they're less than I thought. Only $25 lost. The kitty's been reduced by that sum. Not bad business. Thank you all, members of the board, and you particularly, Mrs. Snow, thank you, and all the folks that have submitted questions. Mr. Cross now has a word for you about next week's contest. Good night, everybody, and please come again. Thank you, Mr. Fadiman. We meet again next week at 8.30 for another quiz contest between the public and the experts. The board of experts for next week will include Mr. Franklin P. Adams, Mr. John Kieran, Mr. Marcus Duffield, and our guest will be Mr. Oscar Levant, well-known composer of popular and serious music, now here on a visit from Hollywood. Send your questions and don't forget to include the correct answers. There are no restrictions on the number you may submit. For each question chosen, you get $2. And if the board flops on that question, you get $5 more. All questions become the property of information, please. Questions on all subjects are welcomed. History, sports, literature, music, science, movies, and so on. Make the questions interesting and amusing on subjects the experts should know and the public would like to learn about. So come on, everybody, join our new game of quizzing and stumping the experts. Send your questions to Information, Please, the National Broadcasting Company, New York City. Until next Tuesday evening at 8.30, we bid you all good night. Good night.